joining us. Um, I'm really pleased to see that we've got many good friends with us for the debate today. Um, although we can't see all your screens, but we know that you're here with us participating and we look forward also to hearing your reactions in the questions and answers at the end. On behalf of FEPS and TASC, it's really a great pleasure today that we're launching our latest joint report on a topic very close to mine and all of our hearts on just transition, uh, which is about making sure that climate action happens swiftly and that it's inclusive. The publication is entitled The People's Transition, Community-Led Development for Climate Justice and includes a case study focused on rural communities in Ireland. But more importantly, I'm especially delighted that we have so many amazing speakers with us today. Um, here we have Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, and also, if I may say, my she hero uh, for all the work that you've done on climate justice. It's thrilled uh, that I finally meet you, Mary. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to meet you there uh, when you joined FEPS last in New York uh, in September for our United for Climate Justice event. So uh, believe me, it's a real honor. Thank you. <laughs> um, we also have Diderik Samsom, who's head of cabinet of Frenz Timmermans at the European Commission. Um, he is the person who has the very difficult job of making sure the EU Green Deal is delivered. <laughs> Um, also for the panel, we have Pedro Marquez, MEP, joining us today, Holly Cairns, TD from Ireland, Montserrat Mir from the Just Transition Centre, and also uh, we have a special guest who's joining us as a late addition to the programme, um, in case some of you weren't aware, is Joe O'Brien, TD Minister of State responsible for community and rural affairs in Ireland. So welcome to you all. And of course, not forgetting, uh, we're here today with Sean McCabe, who is the author of this report. And together also with Maria Jao Rodriguez, FEPS president, and Saeed El Kadrawi, who is special advisor at FEPS, and he's going to be moderating the session today. Okay. Just a few technical <laughs> details. <laughs> no, please, please, yes. Sean. I'm just gonna say a few technical details before we start. Um, the session is going to be around one hour, 45 minutes. Um, so we aim to finish at about 11.45 Dublin time and 12.45 Brussels time. If anybody of the audience wants to react, please do so uh, throughout. And also we'll have the questions and answers at the end. So you can put those in the chat. Uh, we're also going to be on Twitter. We're already here on Facebook and we'll be uh, recording this, which will be on our FEPS YouTube channel uh, later on. If I may, just uh, before we do, um, before I do pass the floor to Saeed, if I could just take a screenshot, to fo a photo to capture the moment, please. Um, if everybody could just smile at the camera and I'm going to try and do this. Uh, so after three, one, two, three. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so Saeed, without further ado, I pass the floor to you first, thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, and, and thanks also to all of you for joining us at this event that is basically about how we can empower people at a very local level in our communities uh, to co-create the change that we need and, and achieve a number of co-benefits because uh, climate action, the way it is being designed through the European Green Deal is, is of course about much more than only reducing emissions. It's actually about developing a new social economic model. And I think it's very timely uh, to, to have this event almost one year after the launch of the Green Deal umbrella communication, um, and, and also close to the adoption of the so-called uh, climate pact that the commission is going to launch in December. Um, as far as I understand, this will be about how bottom-up initiatives can be supported, network created, good practices exchanged and so on. Uh, we come back to, to some of these issues in a second, uh, when we'll dive into the publication that was mentioned already by, by Charlotte. Um, but first, let me uh, give the floor immediately to Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, President of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies and also Chair of the uh, Party of European Socialist Economic and Financial Network. Maria, you, you have the floor for a few minutes, and then we come uh, back to Diederik and Mary. Many thanks, Said, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we, FAPS, together with the task, we are extremely proud to launch today this study in this online uh, conference, dealing with this uh, big theme everywhere in Europe and in the world, is uh, 
to see the green transition as a transition for people. Uh, we are calling for a, a just transition, but let's be clear, this just transition can only help and happen if uh, people are really involved. So this was our purpose with this study and now with this conference. And in fact, this is uh, taking place in an extremely special moment, in fact, an historical moment, because uh, we are confronted with COVID crisis, dramatic crisis. All of us, we are understanding that we need to change uh, the way our economies, our societies work. This is also a big moment, not only for a fiscal stimulus, but for a big transformation. This is being designed right now. Uh, we are also involving people by launching the climate pact. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we are fighting to have the necessary financial instruments. Even tomorrow, uh, European Council uh, will take place to discuss exactly this, because we had an agreement on the design of the next European budget and uh, a special recovery fund, uh, but we need to complete uh, this agreement. And this is indeed a decisive uh, moment for Europeans. Uh, that's why this study and this conference, we believe, uh, are really so timely. Uh, we uh, could conclude that if you really want to involve people uh, and we need to have uh, a new kind of community leadership, listening to people, uh, giving people a real possibility to co-design policies, and monitor all the process always involving people. Otherwise, this green transition will not work. Well, I'm sure that's our um, rapporteur, uh, our brilliant expert, leading expert, Shane McKay, will be uh, very inspiring in this presentation. But to start with the exceptional uh, range of speakers, and uh, we are so honored to count indeed on Mary Robinson, former president of the Republic of Ireland, former president of the United Nations Commission for Human Rights, and now uh, the chair of the United Nations Elderly Committee. Uh, Mary, this is really a great honor. You were with us uh, before the climate summit two years ago in New York. We will never forget this. Uh, and he, again, we are leading personality for this fight together with our uh, first Vice President of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, who is now today greatly represented by the head of the office, Dedrick Samson. Uh, many thanks, Dedrick, for joining us. And then after the presentation of the study, we'll have a very good panel. And I'm so pleased that uh, we could count even uh, to, um, to have uh, the minister in charge of community development in Ireland. So this is indeed a golden moment for us and many thanks also for those who are participating and uh, let's work together for the next uh, phase. I hand uh, over to you, Said. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for these kind words and uh, nice introduction. Let's move now to the first session uh, of this event. Uh, man, as was mentioned already by, by Maria and and Charlotte, we have uh, two really distinguished uh, guests uh, in, in our first session, Mary Robinson and Diedrich Samson. Uh, first, Mary Robinson, I, uh, we all know uh, that, that you are involved since so many years already in um, what's at the core of, 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 of the Green Deal, uh, climate justice. You, you've also been involved in, in the protection of biodiversity, amongst other things. Uh, so, um, I would like to invite you to tell us a bit more in a few minutes uh, how you think we can increase public support uh, because as was mentioned before it needs to be coming from the bottom up uh, the, the support for the, the radical transformation of our economy and society that is needed actually to achieve our climate objectives um, and what can be done to make this a very positive story actually uh, about local development. So, Mary, you have the floor, please. Thank you, and greetings to all. And thank you to Maria and all at FEPS and TASC 
for hosting today's event. It's a pleasure to be here to help launch this FEPS task report, the People's Transition, Community-Led Development for Climate Justice. I'm very pleased to see the focus on climate justice throughout this report. Uh, Sean McCabe, the author, uh, worked with my foundation on climate justice for six years, and I'm happy to see the principles developed by the foundation continue to inform his work. And I, I must just mention also another colleague, Dr. Tara Schein, who has produced a book called Change by Degrees, which is full of advice for practical ways in the home or in the community to make change. So I'm very proud of my former colleagues. There are two fundamental moral imperatives that underpin climate justice. The first is recognizing that we must protect those most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and ensure a safe world for future generations by taking action to reduce emissions and build adaptive capacity. The second demands that as we act, we don't undermine the rights and dignity of people already living in marginalized or vulnerable situations. These aren't just moral standpoints, they're also practical. With the window to act on climate change closing and the impacts of climate breakdown increasingly frequent and severe, there's an understandable desire to act with urgency, to just get what needs to be done, done. Consumed with this sense of urgency, issues of fairness and equity may seem to be a hindrance, a potential impediment to fast climate action. It may even be tempting to consider taking action as the ultimate measure of fairness, because of course, a planet marked by catastrophic climate change won't be fair. However, urgency at any cost will, only, will not only trample on the rights of people in vulnerable situations, it also, I believe, fails to recognize the role that fairness and equity have in ensuring climate action is successful. Put simply, without fairness, it will not be possible to get what needs to be done, done. For climate action to be fast, it, I believe it must be fair. Therefore, we must ensure, sorry, I just have to find my place again. This is what happens to um, uh, elders when they are trying to use technology. Um, so bear with me for a moment. Um, uh, where on earth? Yeah, hang on. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, therefore, we must ensure that measures are in place to syst systematically embed fairness into climate action. Without such measures, we won't advance climate justice and we will put the success of climate action at risk. Empirical evidence suggests that climate policy in European member states will be inherently regressive low-income households would lose a higher share of their consumption than high-income households. If climate policy is unfair or is perceived to be unfair, it will be met with resistance and delay. We've seen in France how the Yellow Vest movement arose out of a carbon tax perceived to be regressive, hitting poor communities hardest. Here in Ireland, the opposition of the water charges should serve as a cautionary tale as to the power that people and communities can wield in terms of blocking policy when they choose to do that. However, if we put fairness at the heart of policymaking and empower communities to be the driving force behind the transformation, we stand a really good chance because fairness builds social acceptance. When we include people, when we cooperate, co-create solutions with communities, when people see their lives improve thanks to climate action, then they won't only just support it, they will demand it. This is the fastest possible route to a successful transition. A shared transition, a just transition, requires unprecedented ambition. The European Green Deal holds this ambition, ambitious potential. This must become the central mission of the European Union, a project of interdependence and solidarity, not just between member states, but with the global community as we seek to realize the world described by the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's welcome too that Commissioner Timmermans and his team are steadfastly committed to ensuring a just transition through the European Climate Deal, Green Deal. Thanks to the tireless advocacy of trade unions, decision makers now understand 
that climate action poses risks to workers in high emission sectors and to their communities. I hope that the just transition mechanism can secure the future and livelihoods of workers and their communities in the transition to a low carbon economy through a focus on social dialogue, participation, and a commitment to human rights. The research challenges decision makers to recognize the following three factors in planning to tackle climate change. Firstly, to avert a climate catastrophe, European leaders will need to be courageous and undertake transformative climate action, maybe in the absence of significant public support. Secondly, for climate action to be successful and enduring in the absence of that public support, it must improve standards of living and enhance well-being while reducing emissions. And finally, people care more about local development than climate action. In developing plans to tackle climate change, decision makers should seek to match appropriate climate strategies to the needs and priorities of communities themselves. This speaks to three principles of climate justice. Decisions on climate action should be participatory, the benefits and burdens of climate action should be shared equitably, and those decisions should support the right to development. The People's Transition recognizes the importance of listening to and learning from local knowledge when seeking to design people-centered climate policy. It speaks to the potential of the transition to build trust between citizens and decision makers. At a time when distrust and populism are on the rise, this report shines a light on how climate action itself can restore confidence and solidarity. So it's timely that FEPS and TASC should produce this piece of work. The people's transition now as the EU considers how to implement the European Green Deal and as we plan to come back together in the wake of the pandemic has kept us, that has kept us apart for so many months now. Because at the heart of the people's transition model is the simple but radical idea of communities coming together to build their own future. I was actually struck by the journey that Sean took um, as part of his research traveling around Ireland in a camper van to listen to the aspirations of communities on the brink of transition. It reminded me very much of my own travels around the country when I was campaigning for the presidential election in 1990, 30 years ago. I was also traveling to listen to and to learn from the communities I visited. It was obvious then, as it is now, that local communities have the creativity, identity, heritage, and initiative to forge a bright future. They just need their governments to give them the tools and resources to enable genuine community-led development. So I hope the European Green Deal, Deal will finally embrace the potential of community and catalyze a just transition that's both for the people and by the people, the people's transition. And I'm really excited about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That's, that's uh, very nice. I think you, you, you emphasized a lot the, the, the many dimensions of climate justice. Uh, we have, of course, uh, look, looking at it from a global perspective, the, the North-South dimension, but also within our own countries, our own communities, uh, a, a lot of inequalities that need to be uh, kind of addressed and, 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 and prevented. Um, I was wondering maybe if you, uh, in, in a few words, could, could tell us a bit more about how you see actually the role of the European Union in, in all of this. Uh, what can the European Union do to make sure that at a very local level, I mean, so far away from Brussels, let's say, uh, mm. things can uh, move in, in, in the right direction in, uh, towards climate justice, basically? Yes, climate justice requires that EU member states rapidly reduce emissions. And this means ambitious, nationally determined contributions, which must ratchet up the um, ambition for the um, Paris Agreement and um, accelerate the provision of climate finance while protecting and increasing their aid budgets to enable pro-poor, um, uh, 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 low carbon and climate resilient development in all countries. However, the EU must look internally and ensure that climate action addresses inequality and marginalization. Access to information and participation decision-making are fundamental human rights, essential to protection of these rights and governments should implement participatory rights and dispute resolution mechanisms at international and national level to limit the influence of vested interests in climate policy and the lobbying which we know takes place, including in the European Parliament, and address any human rights violations arising from climate action. So it's, it's going to be a really um, compelling time 
But I believe if we get the community bottom-up support, it will work. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we, we, we come back to you and uh, after we, we hear from, from Diedrich Samson. Uh, Diedrich, uh, thanks for joining us. You are, of course, dealing with this on a daily basis. Uh, I would like to hear from you a bit uh, how you see the role of the European Union in delivering on, on, a, on, a, on climate justice and what, what are the key building blocks that have already been launched that are relevant in this discussion and maybe uh, more importantly uh, what should be the next steps uh, because we want to, to also uh, hear a bit uh, about your ideas on, 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 uh, on the future on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Said. Thank you very much for this introduction. And indeed, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here in this uh, conference on the people's transition, which would be, have been a pretty good name for the Green Deal. Um, but we have already had the Green Deal as a trademark. But to give you some context, the, the Green Deal stands out from normal environmental plans, as we have seen dozens of in the last decade from the European Commission. Uh, in three ways, um, one of them obviously being its ambition. Uh, for once, politicians didn't go for the feasible, the pragmatic, the lowest common denominator. Now, for once, we mustered all our strengths and our, our guts and went for that's what's needed to prevent the destruction of our ecosystem uh, for future generations. Hence, the climate neutrality goal, but also the goal to stop uh, the loss of biodiversity. Because comparing apples to peers, the loss of biodiversity might be just as big or even a bigger threat to future societies as climate change is. And that's also the, the second uh, distinction between the Green Deal and normal environmental plans. We didn't write a plan for transport and for and then another plan for energy and then another one for uh, agriculture and then another one for water. No, we made one plan for one ecosystem. Uh, a consistent, coherent approach. And come to think of it, that's actually pretty logic. There is only one ecosystem uh, and we live in it, we live from it. Everything within it is connected with each other as we now endure in the COVID-19 crisis. And we should preserve it for ourselves and for future generations. And then the third, uh, the topic of this conference, the third aspect of the Green Deal that made it different from normal environmental policies is that the justness of it, the just transition, is put front and center. Um, and that's for good reason. Because we know that every transition, and this is going to be a big one, but every transition in the past, the industrial revolutions, brought us, apart from a jump forward in prosperity, also a sort of a Darwinistic nature. And they always ended up with more money and more power in the hands of fewer people. Uh, the invention of the steam engine was maybe the best or the worst example of that. And the owner of the steam engine had everything and the guys that need to, to work with it had almost nothing. And the rise of social movements was obviously uh, the consequence of that, trying to repair the damage afterwards. And that's how Europe moved forward uh, pretty successfully, sometimes less successfully. So repairing the damage of a transition afterwards. And this time it should be different because we cannot afford to make this transition and then start to repair as good as we can the damage that is done on the way. No, the, the yellow vests, but also other developments tell us that it will not work like that. We are in a different society. and This transition is too big to, approach, to take that conventional approach. And as EVP Timmermans uh, always says, therefore, this will have to be a just transition, otherwise there just will not be any transition. And that task, I can tell you, is the most difficult of all. Um, I'm obviously, uh, we are challenged with the, uh, with the energy questions on uh, putting all, all those windmills and solar panels. We are challenged with the transport issues of the emission, bringing down the emissions there. But the, those challenges are technical, financial, governance, this is real at the heart of society, how to make that just transition happen. And that question becomes even more adamant and bigger and more urgent in the current context of COVID-19. Because what happened in the COVID-19 crisis, and I'm actually glad uh, to, to be able to tell you this, that while normally politicians would be distracted by the urgency and the immediate question of dealing with a health crisis and would shelve 
any long-term horizon plans that we have for the future, like the Green Deal. That would happen normally. That didn't happen now. What we did is actually we used the Green Deal as, a, as our recovery strategy, as our growth strategy to build back from uh, this COVID-19 crash and to build back greener, build back better. Uh, and that's a very uh, welcome development. But it also presses more challenges to that justness transition question, because if you press fast forward on the Green Deal, you double down on your targets. While the economy is in reverse, the gap only gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So the challenge gets bigger, too. And hence the just transition mechanism that we, in our proposal, quintuples from the original proposal to use it in the, as a recovery instrument. Well, in all its wisdom and maybe also greed, the council decided to lower that again, but we still have uh, an almost tripling of the just transition mechanism in its or in its design to take those regions in Europe along that have a bigger challenge than usual because their economy is completely based on fossil fuels and their jump into the future is therefore a, a leap forward instead of just uh, a walk into the into the future. Mm -hmm. um, the just transition mechanism is not the only way we address this, this bigger challenge. Uh, the other way is that from the Green Deal items or plans or ideas or projects, we took the ones that deliver on the just transition more prominently than others. And one of the best examples of that is the renovation wave. Uh, it's a triple whammy, uh, so to speak, because by putting the renovation wave up front in, in the recovery package, you obviously deliver jobs and growth, especially to SMEs who are the hardest hit in this, in this pandemic. You also deliver sustainability because insulated homes and solar panels deliver on sustainability, but you also deliver a lower energy bill to the people living in those houses. And when we, as we plan, are able to start this renovation wave at the places where affordable housing is uh, based for in, where the people live with the well the low incomes they can use some extra purchasing power in these times they can use a lower energy bill um, so that's one of the other examples and the third example uh, touching upon uh, the, the the subject of today is obviously the climate pact because this is not going to happen top down a just transition can can by design not happen on a, in a top-down way. Obviously, some plans have to make uh, have to be made here in this Berlamont building and all the, the big frameworks and the, the huge sums of money, etc. But the real work, the real vibe of the Green Deal is not happening in the Berlamont building. It's happening out there in rural areas, in cities, in, in communities. And that's why I have my hopes on the Climate Pact as a new era, a new joint operation between people and governments on all levels, local, national, and also indeed European, uh, to make a just transition happen. I want to stress, we are going to learn a lot on the way. We are going to make a lot of mistakes. Nobody in the, on this planet has ever embarked on this journey before. Um, but if we are able to stick together in this, and make this a real people's transition, I'm very hopeful that we will be successful. Thank you. Great, Dietrich. Thank you very much. For this. Um, I think you emphasized a lot that this uh, Green Deal is indeed a multi-level exercise. I mean, uh, combining top-down and bottom-up and uh, also a multi-stakeholder, uh, bringing everybody on board. I also um, take note of the fact that for you, this uh, climate justice goes way beyond um, the just transition mechanism, but uh, in a way should be built in the design of all the policies uh, that uh, we are going to develop. Because as, uh, as you know, it does not only affect particular regions, it also disrupts whole industrial sectors throughout Europe and also people, individuals. Um, and and uh, you mentioned the, the crisis we're in, the COVID-19 crisis, and the way uh, the European Commission tried to uh, to, to link the recovery uh, to the, the key priority, which is the Green Deal transition. Uh, but of course, we all know the proof of the, eat, of the pudding is in the eating. Huh? Uh, so the, the different national plans are being designed. 
and I guess at some point they come to you, to the commission. And so I, I'm wondering, uh, how are you going to assess these plans and what are actually the type of projects you, you expect these plans to, uh, you know, to, to support in the, in the years, uh, in the months and years to come? Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, that's going to be the, the challenge of the next year, basically. Uh, obviously, we started designing this next generation EU, and within that next generation EU, we now also have hipster names, obviously, in the European Commission. Uh, we have the recovery and resilience facility, and that's the pot of money that is available for 27 governments uh, on the basis of their own national recovery plans. And first of all, we uh, designed a complete manual or an a la carte menu for uh, those plans, um, including projects like Renovation Wave, including projects like the hydrogen infrastructure or charging infrastructure along our, our roads. So the, so to speak, the, the, the green recovery investments that countries could uh, embark on, could envisage to do. But that's how we, uh, how we do things in Europe, because we are not des deciding what Poland and what Germany and what Italy and, and what Ireland uh, will um, come up with. But we are trying to nudge them into the right direction. And with uh, some success, I can already say, um, the jury is still out there, uh, but, and the plans are still in development. But I think we will be able to design or to create one European project out of those 27 recovery plans. Because yes, all countries have their own specific uh, priorities or hobby horses uh, sometimes, but they all can, they can all see the merits and the added value of doing things together. So what we're doing right now is indeed, for instance, on hydrogen, the investments, we are uh, at the moment assessing the best let framework, the, less, the best aorta for uh, the hydrogen uh, pipelines throughout Europe so that every region in Europe can profit from it. And we delivering those ideas to member states and telling them, hey, you can, have, you can work together to make this happen. And we expect positive responses from that. So our challenge is indeed to, to meld those 27 plans into one big recovery project, which mm -hmm. makes Europe as a whole stronger. Yeah, and I and I also assume that that the member states are kind of supposed also to to organize, uh, uh, you know, uh, together with with uh, their stakeholders uh, uh, talks and and to exchange ideas and and to go develop basically the, these plans. I think that's also an important uh, element. Um, Diederik and and Mary, maybe a last question because we are running out of time to both of you. Uh, in about one year, we will uh, be at COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and, and so we all know, we've heard from both of you, I think 2021 will be really a, a crucial uh, year, uh, make or break basically the, the Green Deal and, and uh, show uh, how it can be delivered on the ground. So I'm, I'm wondering, let's imagine we are one year further. What would you like? Uh, of what would you both hope to see achieved actually uh, by then? Uh, around green deal about around green green recovery what are the key issues that should be done in in, in 2021 uh, maybe first mary and then and then Diedrich. mary uh, well, what are your ideas about that looking uh, forward i think first of all it's very good to hear that the uh, european commission understands the bottom up approach now and the uh, community transition that is part of the just transition that's really refreshing but we we've, we've learned a valuable lesson from covid-19 and that is that collective human behavior matters. Uh, it's what's protecting us from the virus at the moment in the absence of a vaccine. But that collective human behavior um, uh, has to trust um, the, the decision makers. And if there's a breakdown in trust, it, it doesn't work. So um, I think it's very important because local participatory approaches are quite messy and they are a bit resource intensive. So we need to see a dramatic increase in investment in education and participation and access to information and capacity building um, as mandated in Article 6 of the UN FCCC and the Principle 10 of the Rio uh, Convention to engage people around the world. Um, and so we need the governments to be ambitious, we need corporations to do their bit, but more and more we need the participation of people and that that is core and enabled um, as this People's Transition Report um, calls for. Um, 
I did see it in 1990, believe me, when I was going around the country at a different time. The capacity for self-development, the volunteering that was going on in Ireland to provide for children, for sports, for the elderly, for people with disabilities, because those facilities weren't there. And people kind of were energized um, by having a little bit more resources. Now we have the difficulty that COVID has you know, taken a lot of the resources. So we have to dig deeper to find that community uh, spirit. But I think it will be essential for a successful COP in Glasgow next year. Okay, thank you, Mary. Diederik, what are your thoughts? Yes, obviously, uh, like everybody else, I was disappointed that we had to delay uh, the COP26. But to be honest, now I look back at it as a blessing in disguise because it gives us one extra crucial year for Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, for Europe, because we can now lead by example, we can enhance our own targets, we can show, we can show the first delivery, and the first concrete actions within the context of the European Green Deal, and that creates trust also amongst people. But what most, what a lot of people on the street tell you is, okay, yeah, if Europe does this, fine, great. But if the rest of the world doesn't embark on the same journey, the planet will be um, destroyed anyway, because we are only 10% of the emissions. Well, whatever you think of that, it is a valid argument. So we need this year to invite the rest of the world to embark on this same journey. And that is happening right now at mind boggling speed, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wouldn't have been able to do that in Glasgow when it, Glasgow would be happening, well, as we, as we speak, by the way. Um, but next year, we will have China with a uh, climate neutrality goal. And because of China, we have Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. and obviously one of the most important players, we have, we'll have a new administration in the US. Imagine that we would right now be sitting in Glasgow looking at what that horrible man is right is doing right now uh, the, the current president in uh, in the us and we wouldn't be able to make any progress next year that is going to be very different but only if only if we can show uh, if europe can lead by example both on the let's say high fly target and financial issues that are always very important in cop negotiations but also with concrete uh, results with with things to show for, and things to show for can only happen if we start implementing uh, the green deal there where it needs to happen in your homes, at your streets, with your car, uh, and with the way you commute to to the office, with the office itself. All those things need to happen now and as soon as possible, and we can only start that when we make this a real people's transition. All right, good. Thank you very much, Diederik, and. Uh... Uh, Mary, uh, both of you, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to, to have uh, you with us. Uh, let's move now to the, to the other star of the day, uh, the author of the publication we uh, are speaking about, uh, Sean McCabe. Uh, I think you're going to introduce a bit of study and, and uh, share with us some of the key insights. Uh, Sean, please, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Said, and um, thank you, Mary and Diedrich and Charlotte and Maria and everyone who's contributed. It's it's really exciting to um, have you all taking part in a rare uh, a rare occurrence for November in Dublin. I'm being blinded by the sun, um, but today is about um, a publication that we've been working on for about a year and a half. Um, it's involved extensive consultation. And one thing I'd like to say just straight off the bat is that it only exists because of the incredible dedication and um, spirit of, of so many uh, community leaders, community organizations around Ireland and, and across Europe um, from whom I was able to learn and, and compose this report. Um, it is uh, fundamentally a uh, guide to try to facilitate bottom-up approaches. And um, I'm going to present just quickly the, uh, I'll share my screen here. Is that visible to you all? I'm just gonna present quickly um, the structure of the report. It is a big report. I would encourage people to take their time and, 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 and have a look at it when they get a chance. Um, but here we can touch on some of the key issues. First of all, 
the background, where did the report come from? Um, why do we need a people's transition? What exactly is it and how does it work? So it's quite, quite straightforward, the structure of today's presentation. So the background to this um, is we began with a, a, a case study for just transition for rural communities in Ireland. So um, we are aware, uh, and thanks, as, as Mary said, to tireless advocacy on the part of trade unions, we have become increasingly aware of the risk of stranded workers and stranded communities in the face of um, climate action as we wean our societies off fossil fuels. However, there are those groups that maybe are, are, are not typically unionized or maybe harder to reach. And, and one such group is farmers. Um, so we said we would take a look at a sector which contributes the most to I Ireland's uh, emissions profile. It's a sector also with the highest level of income inequality. Um, and, it, and, and, and the people in, in uh, farming and, uh, and, and rural Ireland in general face other multidimensional deprivation issues around transport and connectivity. Um, and also, um, it stands out um, as one of the sectors to be most at risk from the impacts of climate change. So, the case study lasted, um, I suppose, the guts of six months, the, the work on it. We, we, we made three short documentaries in uh, West Cork and Kerry here in Ireland. They're linked in the report. I'd encourage you to watch them. They're um, five minutes each, and uh, they include one Holly Kearns, who is now participating here as an elected representative. Well, she was an elected representative at the time on the local council. She's now in our, um, uh, in our Oireachtas. And then we, I, I really was humbled by the experience of meeting so many people when I embarked on the road trip that Mary mentioned. I spent three weeks driving around the country, meeting farmers, meeting fishermen, meeting shopkeepers, meeting anyone who talked to me about the future that they would like for themselves and for their communities. Um, and as, as Mary said, I, I was very struck by the creativity, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit and, and, and the community spirit that existed. And um, it is not only, uh, I suppose, a glue that binds together the fabric of society, it's also our greatest hope in, in making the transition that we're facing. Um, so the case study is detailed uh, in the report, but I just wanted to point out some key, key uh, takeaways. First is that there was no real opposition to climate action. There was just an opposition from people to the possibility of their lives being made more difficult. Um, and, and it was clear that prioritizing a legislative environment that favors large business models has the potential to detrimentally impact the well-being of communities because those models essentially um, extract produce and time and creativity from communities and the community gains little in return. So to enable a just transition, it, it, it seems logical that the legislative environment should create the conditions for well-being and, and, and the potential to achieve positive social local, importantly, social, economic, and environmental outcomes, not, not national, but local. Um, and to achieve this, what we used for the rest of the study was uh, Amartya Sen's uh, capability lens, um, because really what we want to do is expand the capabilities of, of communities, understand how climate action itself can expand the capabilities of communities, see how the supply chains or the labor chains for climate action could be harnessed to create community businesses or build community wealth. And if we can do that, we will begin the process towards, uh, I think, a virtuous cycle for, for climate action. So the question then became, how should what we found out on that journey potentially influence uh, EU policy making? As Diedrich uh, mentioned and, and, and detailed clearly, we have a real, real opportunity now with the European Green Deal. Not only is it holistic, um, it's taking in all aspects of the transition. It also has this take everyone along component, the just transition mechanism. And as was mentioned as well, the European Climate Pact, which will be launched early next month. What I would suggest from, my re from, from the research that went into this report is that all of the decision making around the climate pact and the just transition mechanism starts from a place of empathy. 
And to start from a place of empathy, to start with understanding communities, understanding their perspectives, you have to listen to them and you have to learn from them. Um, as Mary said, that is resource intensive, but we'll come back to that. So why do we need a people's transition? Well, there's three points that I would like to um, develop here today. The first of them is that governments will need to take climate action in the absence of widespread public support. Now, the reason we can say that is because that climate action is needed about 10 years ago. It's, it, so it's of the utmost importance that the next 10 years aren't squandered. Uh, if we look at the IPCC's special report on 1.5 and, and this graph, which I've extracted from it, we can see that on the standard deviation, or the, the orange line represents the averages, which the report tells us we need to stick to in order to reduce emissions in line with a goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if we look at the standard deviation in the worst possible scenario, we overshoot 1.5 degrees Celsius in about three years time. So we have absolutely no time to waste. And um, the reductions in emissions are across all greenhouse gases. It's not just carbon. And we should be aiming for zero. And we should be aiming for zero sooner than 2050. So in reality, um, we have to do this in a way that promotes well-being. Because climate policy intersects with people's lives. We know that. We've seen, thanks to the work of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, um, that there has been a significant spike in human rights allegations against renewable energy companies uh, over the last 10 years. We've also seen, as, as has been mentioned previously, the rise of the yellow vests as a result of climate policy that was viewed as regressive. And perhaps most concerningly, and particularly for um, progressives, um, is that the rise of the right is linked to climate policy making. Some of the, um, some of the uh, inherent values that place us on a political spectrum uh, are quite immutable. They won't change quickly. And they certainly won't change over the time period that we're looking at in terms of taking climate action. So if decision makers are waiting for that moment of opportunity when there is widespread public support for climate action before acting, we are not going to make it. Um, and I, the word perception is important here because oftentimes you will hear people in the environmental movement or people in the climate movement saying, oh, well, this group of people simply don't understand that life could be better for them. They just be, they're resisting because they're being misled by uh, vested interest, potentially. They're being misled by a media. Whatever uh, excuses that we come up with, really it doesn't matter because Perception is nine-tenths of the natural law. And so there's only so long you can write articles about the end of farming and the completely uh, re-radicalizing of the food system before you worry people enough that they will protest. And uh, we saw this just yesterday with Dutch farmers um, protesting the, the uh, legislation around uh, nitrous oxide. Um, we're also not dealing with a particularly favorable landscape in terms of trust in decision making. Uh, here I've plotted the climate change performance index for 2020 against the perceptions of corruption index for 2019. What you see is that the countries with the most to do in terms of climate action actually have the highest perception uh, or, or well, the, they have the lowest score on the perception of corruption index, meaning um, they have a high mistrust of their political system. So this is something we also have to overcome in terms of taking climate action. The second point I'd like to elaborate is that to be successful, climate action must enhance standards of living and ensure equal access to opportunity. Um, we have seen over the past and um, particularly the past 30 years, a widening inequality in Europe. Now, it has stabilized since 2010, but um, we are struggling with inequality. And at the same time, we're struggling with certain neoliberal approaches to um, community in general, which results in the rollback of state-provided uh, services and the rollout of market-based approaches or a focus on individualism. Now, the problem with individualism uh, 
I think, is that we're very unlikely to consume our way out of a crisis that was brought about by excess consumption. And the problem with creating competition for scarce resources with, with, between communities is that it's very unlikely to provide for a smooth transition. So what, we, what needs to happen is uh, we need to ask ourselves, how can climate action proactively build social approval? Fundamentally, people care more about local development than they do about climate action. Um, so if we are genuine in our desire to see climate action, we uh, at the local level, we have to support local development that is sustainable. So we have to align objectives when engaging with communities in climate action, the objectives of the communities, the needs and priorities of the communities with the objectives of climate action. And that engagement around climate action cannot be separated from the broader community development or well-being objectives. And climate action needs to be understood as a long-term process embedded within local development, rather than one-off projects or consultations that um, enter and exit people's lives. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is create a virtuous cycle um, of local climate action, uh, where a community is engaged as an implementing partner and, and in turn that climate action addresses their needs and priorities because they've been engaged in the design of it. Uh, and then communities capabilities expand and their standards of living is enhanced. And that increases the trust they have in the decision making, which in turn leads to a greater demand for climate action, which again, they can be engaged in. So it's a participation, uh, it's a valuing of local knowledge, and it's a co-creation and co-ownership that will really mobilize local climate action. So what is it, it being the people's transition? Well, uh, the people's transition is a proposal for a model of participative climate action in the EU. It's, it's, it's a, a framework devised from the experiences of the case study here in Ireland, but also uh, extensive consultation with many other organizations like um, across Europe who are expert in, in, in the managing of, of participative approaches. Um, it prioritizes local development and community ownership of climate solutions, and it aims to build public support for climate action by improving standards of living and addressing inequality through that climate action. How does it um, gel with the just transition? Well, what I would say is it creates an enabling environment for the just transition. The focus of the just transition has to remain on workers and their communities and ensuring that particularly those working in high fossil fuel extractive sectors um, are provided for and are able to make the transition away from, from those jobs. Um, but where this people's transition can create an enabling environment is that through the capacity, uh, the capabilities approach, it, we ensure that people have the freedom to achieve well-being and that that is achieved through arriving at real opportunities um, that they want and they have reason to value. And that's very important because in the conversation about um, just transition, you know, there's a number of ways where we could claim a just transition that wouldn't be just at all. For example, if somebody has to move thousands of kilometers to find a new job and leave their community, but they have a new job, is that a just transition? Or if you have a scenario where a person leaves a job that they enjoyed and, and has to take a job that they view as menial, is that a just transition? So local development can create the enabling environment and climate action geared towards local development can do that even faster. So how does a people's transition fit with climate justice? Um, Mary elaborated these points earlier, but there are three fundamental, um, well, there's seven principles of climate justice that the Mary Robinson Foundation developed. Um, here's three of them that are captured by this people's transition very clearly. First of all is supporting the right to development. The second is sharing the benefits and burdens of climate action equitably and fairly. And the third is to ensure that participative decisions or that decisions are participative, tra uh, transparent and accountable. So the people's transition looks a little bit like this. Uh, down at the bottom here, you have inequality. A capabilities approach should provide you with a more stable foundation addressing uh, where issues of inequity, where people have difficulty participating, where people have difficulty having their voices heard. And we have to understand that landscape of inequity before you can properly build a transition. Um, 
Then fundamental to meaningful participation is this idea of foster, fostering trust. It's a valuing of local knowledge and it's a building of capacity at the local level. And if we do those successfully, you should be able to get arrive at a situation where communities can co-own climate solutions. Uh, whether that's through community wealth building or through the EU's community-led local development initiative or through other community ownership models like those pioneered by, the, uh, by Plunkett, there's a, a wide variety of, of opportunities here for um, communities to share in the benefits of climate action. So specifically, the people's transition looks like this. It's, it's um, dialogues, localized dialogues that do that job of fostering trust and gathering local knowledge and building capacity, whilst also distilling out communities' needs and priorities. Um, and then rolling those needs and priorities into local action plans, where you are seeking to address those needs and priorities through the three pillars that we discussed earlier, or maybe participative budgeting could also be a, a tool used in, in realizing um, those action plans. What that looks like very much depends on the community. There is no one size fits all model for this. So the, the onus will be on experts to work with communities to, to identify where there are genuine advantages for community owned, community led climate action. In agriculture, it might be local food co-ops. It might be community owned silver pasture planting initiatives. In energy, it could be renewable energy co-ops. It could be retrofitting co-ops. In connectivity, we could be looking at uh, uh, co-op working spaces, uh, community-owned transport systems. There's really um, no end. The only limit on this is, is the creativity of those involved. So practically, how would it work? Well, I don't want to go into this in great detail here because, again, it's, it's, it's very clearly laid out. Chapter five of the report is essentially a toolkit for the model, which steps you through all of these stages. But there's some things that I would like to flag up as being absolutely essential. The first is that there is pre uh, preparatory work done. There is a significant landscape mapping of the local area that is selected. Um, so first of all, there's a demarcation of the area. It should be very localized. It, we, we, you know, people think very locally. They don't think uh, regionally or nationally. They think about their community, their immediate environment. So that's the level that this work should begin at. Um, there should also be early connectivity with decision makers, whether they're in the local authority or at the national level, to make sure that the outcomes of this process are realized. We need to bring the decision makers with us through every step of the process. Trust is a very valuable thing, and there's nothing worse than putting a community through a participative process and then failing them by not delivering what they have sought through that process. And it, takes years to rebuild that level of distrust, the level of distrust that that, that, that sort of failure creates. Um, so once you bring the community together, once you have identified uh, the community that's involved, there's then a, a body of work required to ensure that those who participate are representative of the community. Think of it as the citizens' assembly at the local level. Um, Oftentimes you will find that the people who participate, if you put out an open call for something like a climate um, uh, issue or, or, or um, other local development issues, the people who participate are the people who can, who have the education to participate, who have the, 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 the standard of living that allows them to participate. Um, if you only include the voices of those who are able to self-select, uh, there's a very high chance that the solutions you reach will recreate the class assumptions that underpinned the inequality of access to that dialogue in the first place. So every effort should be made to level the playing field to ensure that every voice is heard, like if it means putting on childcare so that single mothers can participate in an event, so be it. If it means you're doing it in a rural area and you want to make sure that it fits the calendar of farmers, then make sure that you take advice on what times are best suited or what medium is best suited for organizing the event in such a way. Um, 
And ideally then what the dialogue allows is this reciprocal conversation between experts and community. The experts learn about the community's priorities and, and, and the community learn about their potential in, in, in community business. They learn about concepts of transition. They learn about climate action. Fundamentally, what you're aiming to get out of this process is a local action plan, which can be integrated into local development plans. This is a plan that has gone through um, you know, it reflects the conversation in the community dialogue. The community feels a sense of ownership over it. And, and, and um, it also seeks to address their needs and priorities. So the minute you start taking climate action, uh, they start seeing their lives improve. And once they see their lives improve, as we said previously, you are hoping to start that virtuous cycle of climate action. One last point before we leave it, and this is the concept of climate action as an anchor institution or a temporary anchor institution. An anchor institution is a, um, a, a source of influenceable public spend that can be channeled into a community where the supply chains for that institution um, can provide local work and local jobs. And it's been pioneered by uh, in, in numerous organizations, including uh, CLES in, in the UK and Democracy Collaborative in um, the US. And we should look at climate action as a, a community wealth building um, opportunity. What, would that, what that means is that if we're looking at how to roll out uh, um, climate action initiative, we should be looking at the supply chain and figuring out what components of that supply chain could be owned, could be shared with the community. There's some obvious questions to get out of the way before we finish off here. And um, one is that the question of, well, surely this will have significant cost in terms of time and resources. The answer to that is yes. Um, it will be messy trying to arrange for this level of participation. The answer to that is also yes. Um, and but the final question is, will it significantly delay climate action? And I would argue it absolutely won't. Um, for the reason that Mary stated earlier, in order for climate action to be fast, uh, it has to be fair. Or as Franz Timmermans put it, um, it must be a just transition or there will just be no transition. So that's my presentation. I'd just like to say a few thank yous very quickly. I'd like to thank Charlotte and Feps for incredible work helping me uh, put this together. And um, back in Dublin, I'd like to thank Shana and Jerry who, who worked tirelessly to, to, to get this piece out. I'd also like to thank everyone who met with me uh, on, on that van trip and um, uh, at other points through the production of this research because really, you know, people have been doing this a lot longer than any of us. They are expert in it and they are passionate about their communities, they're passionate about climate action and, and if it wasn't for them, we'd be in a much worse situation than we are now. I'm thinking of uh, organizations like Ecolease, like Urgency, like the Transition Network. These are phenomenal, phenomenal um, uh, people and, and organizations who are really doing an incredible job of advancing local priorities and local climate action. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Sean, and well done and congratulations about all the work that you've done because I know for a fact how hard you've been working on this report and also how much of the detail that you've really gone into. So um, we're so pleased that this is out today and thank you very much for the, for the presentation that you gave there. Um, that's really nice and I think it also sets a very nice framing um, for the discussion as well that we're going to have now um, with the panel. Um, so um, we have still with us, um, who's going to take the floor is, um, just to go through who we have, we have Pedro Marquez, MEP, um, s and Group spokesperson on the Just Transition Fund. He also served as Minister of Planning and Infra Infrastructure in the government um, uh, in Portugal of the government of Costa. Uh, Holly, Holly Cairns, sorry, TD uh, since the election this year, so congratulations to you, a social democrat, but also interestingly a farmer um, and a keen environmentalist, so we're looking to hear from you. Um, and also joining us is Montserrat Mir from the um, ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation Just Transition Centre. Uh, Montserrat also served as Confederal Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation until quite recently as well. And I'm also pleased 
um, to have with us is Joe O'Brien, TD and Minister of State with responsibility for community development and charities at the Department of Rural and Community Development in Ireland. Um, we're going to have questions and answers at the end of this, so please, uh, I hope that everybody's still lively and looking forward to um, posting your questions on the, well, on the questions and answers section, sorry, I keep saying the chat, I mean the questions and answers. I see that people have been lively already, so we're taking a note of those as well, and we'll come back to those uh, quite shortly. Um, just before I do hand the floor to um, Pedro, let me just please take one more uh, capture uh, for the moment of, of a photo, please. So, because um, if we don't do this, you know, it didn't happen. Of course, you know, how we have to do this. So please just once again, if you could smile again and we'll take um, just a quick screenshot. Thank you. One, two, three. Wait, hang on a minute. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Okay, so straight over to Pedro Marquez, please. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte. And uh, thank you, everybody from FEPS, particularly Maria João. It's been now uh, something that we have been doing basically every week. We've been discussing so interesting themes together. Uh, well, uh, some very worrisome, like the, the situation now with the, with the recovery, uh, which is blocked by, by, by a few EPP governments now. That's, that's something that can worry all of us. But uh, as you know, um, at the heart of this recovery is this idea that we want a, a, the, the sister transitions to be, to, be, to be well handled and a huge priority, so digital and green transition. And at the heart of the green transition, at least from our political family, from our political family at the European Parliament, it, it's the, this, this, this clear idea that we need a red heart to the green transition. We need to take care of the social consequences of the green transition. And in a, in a, in a discussion like we are having today here from the beginning, and uh, let me thank uh, FEPS for the, the, the incredible panel organized for the beginning of this of this conference, both the head of cabinet of of of, um, of uh, Franz Timmermans, but obviously all the experiences brought to us by Mary Robertson. It was huge to have her with us also, of course. And the presentation by Sean, which he just did, and uh, clear evidence that he brought from the ground, from the communities it, itself in, in Ireland. And some of the conclusions are very clear also to this group. Uh, and I thank Sean for, for bringing it up. Uh, I mean, we do need to gain concrete communities, uh, concrete people at the communities to the transition, because we know we have to do the transition. In a, if, if we put a, a neutral question to people, everybody would agree on a green transition probably, but then there are the consequences of the green transition. And we have to handle those consequences at the community level, at the local level, because concrete people are affected. Let me just remind, and I will get back to that, that half a million jobs are at risk for instance, on the transition from coal energy production, half a million jobs in Europe. This is huge. These are concrete lives and concrete families that we have to support. Otherwise, as Franz Zimmerman says, either we have a just transition or we won't have any transition at all, as, as Sean just recalled. So we have been uh, um, first very ambitious at the forefront of the ambition on the Green Deal. Let me remind that the, the parliament, for instance, uh, is, is, is pushing at the, and managed at, the, at the, the European climate law. Our S&D group was pushing and we managed to have a goal of 60% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. Uh, but for instance, the 40% target of climate investments in the recovery and resilience facility. These are concrete examples of, 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 of achievements from our political family within the negotiations here at the European Parliament now to be obviously negotiated with the council. But these are clear positions positions that show the ambition on the transition, on the Green Deal from the side of our political family at the parliament. But at the same time, uh, um, we have to acknowledge that this transition will, as I said, as have consequences in the, in the local communities, but also let me also have a minute to say also in the younger generations. The younger generations will have to cope with, I would say, the burden, the consequences of a lot of things happening already. Demographic transition, it's, it's impacting on our societies you, in, a, you, in, in our capacity to create jobs, to create growth immensely. Uh, the, the consequences from the previous crisis 10 years ago in public debt reduction, in, in capacity to grow and create jobs, 
also something that these generations have to handle. And now all that will come out of this crisis will also be on the shoulders of the new generations because it will last for, for, for certainly more than a decade, the capacity to recover completely from the current crisis. So over all of this, we have the, 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 the consequences of the green transition in our capacity to grow and to sustain and create jobs at the community. So that's a lot to be handled and we do need to face and to, and to, and to cope with the social challenges coming from the from the transition working uh, for instance energy poverty it's another example of something that we need to do we need to be more efficient in terms of energy production and consumption and that will probably mean that we'll have to change energy taxation but it, it can impact into those families that have more difficulties in terms of of, of, of of paying for their for their energy for their eating for instance in, in in their houses so we as socialists and social democrats have championed for this concept of a just transition uh, put it put a red heart as i said in to the Green Deal. So concrete examples, the compensatory measures that we defend for the regions most impacted in terms of, uh, for instance, remote regions, when we'll change the, the taxation for the, for, for the avi aviation sector, to give you an example. Um, the, the, the priority to creating jobs in these communities more affected, for instance, from the transition from coal production. That's another important example and a priority of the Just Transition Fund, which I am the rapporteur for our political family at, at the parliament. At the Just Transition Fund, our priority for the eligibility of social policies, social infrastructure and social services within these communities, because they create a lot of jobs, but they also create uh, they, 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 they enable uh, communitarian capacities, the, the, the capacity of a community to sustain their own within the transition. So that's a priority for us, concrete priority at the Just Transition Fund eligibilities. And the priority for the big companies when they want to have any support in the transition regions, they have to create jobs. It's not just about sustaining jobs. They should create jobs, these big companies, if they want any kind of support from the Just Transition Fund within the transition because obviously we have to favor the SMEs, but if any, uh, I would say uh, um, capacity, to, if, if, any, if any big investments are to be done in these transition regions, they have to create jobs. They cannot just go for the money. They have to deal with the social consequences in terms of creating jobs. Um, and uh, on the Just Transition Fund, just to give you another example of our ambition, we are putting forward a very, I would say a very, uh, um, uh, innovative mechanism, which is the green reward mechanism. The green reward mechanism is something that it's coming from the European Parliament to the table of negotiation. It means that about uh, one fifth of the money of the Just Transition Fund will only be and uh, ended to the regions, to the to the countries, if they do deliver on the Green Deal objectives. Not just about saying good words and signing a document, say that they abide by the by the objectives. No, they have to deliver. If they deliver, they get about one fifth of the money. That's our idea with the green reward mechanism. So these are concrete ideas that are within the core of the Just Transition Fund. But as I said, we are doing it now. In the Just Transition Fund, we'll have to do something similar to that probably when we re revise, when we change the, the energy taxation because of the consequences in terms of energy poverty. And as I said, our communities, they have to be uh, involved and they have to be won to the, con to the consequences, but also to the benefits of the transition. That's what we pledge for as, as a group at the European Parliament. And as I said, our message in the end is about putting a red heart to the Green Deal. That's that's our goal and that's where we stand. And I will probably uh, stop now and and, and, and obviously uh, I'll be eager to, to, to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Charles. Lovely, thank you so much, Pedro. Yeah, it's really great that you um, talk about the emphasis also on jobs and of course on generations there. Um, and we do look forward to the developments on the Just Transition um, Fund. Um, so now we going, we're going to turn to Holly. Uh, it's great to have you with us and to meet you, Holly. Um, I think if I understand you're going to talk a bit about, you know, why you'd be motivated also by climate change really to enter into politics, if I understand correctly, and how also this is impacting uh, rural communities and farming especially. Um, so Holly, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, yeah, so I suppose I'm very new to politics. Um, I don't, don't, don't have a history in it or anything like that. And I suppose I initially became engaged through a motivation around the injustice around marriage equality in Ireland and then in relation to uh, reproductive rights. Um, 
And it was from there that I got involved in politics, but those injustices had been sort of addressed at that point. So that wasn't the motivation to keep going. And I suppose I felt the biggest injustice facing us now, and especially the next generation is climate justice. So that was really the motivation to keep going and um, to go ahead and, and, and stand in the election. Um, I suppose my specific interest in relation to farming and agriculture and rural communities in that context is because of my life and my upbringing. So I was reared in uh, West Cork in rural Ireland on a small dairy farm. Um, so it's kind of amazing to think that I was reared on the income of, me and my sister were reared on the income of 16 um, dairy cows. And that would be no longer possible. So we've seen a complete transformation of Irish agriculture in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, really the model has been moving more and more towards intensification. And the result is uh, in an Irish context that we're very unique in Europe in that our single largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions is from agriculture. That's, that's very unusual um, and something that we can't not address. And we know as well that you know, the effects of, of climate change will massively affect uh, farming communities and rural areas, especially coastal areas, um, like where I'm from. So, you know, uh, we see this ongoing problem. Um, we see, uh, you know, Irish agriculture continuously moving in that direction. And, you know, there's kind of a narrative around it that it's good for farmers and, you know, we have to keep this industry going and it's, you know, it's all great. But the reality is that, like I said, if I was reared on the income of 16 dairy cows and, you know, that's no longer viable, we've diversified into uh, dry stock organic beef production and the main focus of our farm is vegetable seed production. But the vast majority of those small farms in Ireland, which is the vast majority of farms, are actually operating at a loss. And we see um, many farming families having to, you know, practice a full time job as well as kind of part time, almost hobby farming um, beef at the moment. So it hasn't favoured farmers, the change in policy, the transformative change over, you know, one lifetime. Um, and that in turn really doesn't support local uh, rural communities because it doesn't keep people on the land. It doesn't offer a viable, um, you know, job or, or career for the next generation. And the narrative that any kind of action um, to, to, to take real climate action will negatively reshape Irish agriculture is one of the biggest problems we see now in terms of actually addressing this issue. Um, there's a lack of ambition in relation to it. And, you know, even in our most recent government formation in the section on agriculture, it says that we'll continue to work towards emission efficiency in relation to the Department of Agriculture. So that's something very different to an actual reduction in the overall emissions in the sector, which is very disappointing when you consider the need to actually reach a target and um, the reality that that won't happen without a reduction in this sector. Um, and that's very much driven by a narrative that tells us all that any change in that sector will negatively reshape Irish agriculture. And the sad result of that is that the communities that will be most affected by climate change are most afraid of climate action. Um, so I would really echo what Sean was saying in relation to the need to engage with communities at a very local level, um, more local than uh, county councils, but also at that level. Um, because the reality is, I think we can really see it in relation to the pandemic at the moment, that unless there's public will and public engagement and the feeling that everybody's in it together and this is, you know, tackling this is something that will all benefit all of us, then we see a non-compliance. And in relation to climate change, shaping the debate around it as something that will be negative for communities is the thing that really prevents us from actually, you know, taking real climate action. So that point that Sean makes, I think, is just so important in terms of, of policy making. If we really started uh, with communities and with farming communities would be my particular interest, um, then that's the only way we can actually make a change and yes it does require big investment and a lot of work but it's absolutely necessary if we're going to take real climate action you know the biggest injustice that we're facing um i think the importance of community involvement and engagement in policy making there's an example in ireland recently that really highlighted this so there was a new um 
law put into place that would prevent large vessels uh, fishing within the six mile nautical zone of the coast. Um, so this was a move to really protect the stocks and replenish them and allow, you know, a small scale, more sustainable industry to continue as well to have stocks to actually fish. Now, that law came into place and then it was appealed by um, the owners of these large trawlers who like, make a considerable profit from being able to pair troll in these areas. The only reason that they won in court and now this law has been overturned is they won on a technical ground, not because of the environment, you know, that the, the environmental concerns weren't accurate, but because when this policy was being made, they didn't engage properly with the community. So now that's been overturned and we see massive negative impact from that. Um, so it just goes to show the importance of it and actually the legal requirements for it. We're bound by these policies under the Oris Convention too. And unfortunately, we, we constantly see, you know, it seems it's, 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 it sounds and it feels like it's going to be cumbersome and tiresome to actually deal with all of these different interest groups and people in, in communities that's going to be so challenging. And it's easy to just make these kind of policies for them rather than really engage with them. Um, so even some of our more progressive policies we had in relation to engagement in the forestry sector, that anybody could appeal um, a decision about a planting or felling license that they felt was problematic, that's recently been removed as well. And we're seeing this kind of legislation being rushed through without any kind of um, standard debate and pre-legislative scrutiny. So we're seeing a constant move in the wrong direction when we really know what the solutions are and we have the evidence to show us that. So I think the policies need to be made in conjunction with the people who will be carrying them out so they feel on board and engaged uh, with, the, with the, the laws around their practices. And really we need to see a complete transformation again in, in relation to Irish agriculture. So an example that I think is a good one to give in relation to how agriculture policy is in Ireland at the moment. A few years ago, a department official came out to our farm in West Cork and um, docked us payments uh, from our area aid payment based on where we had um, areas of land that weren't being used just to graze livestock. So areas where we would grow food, for example, areas where we have natural habitat. Um, so at the moment, the Department of Agriculture in Ireland directly incentivizes you to damage the landscapes that the future of the industry depends on, that all of the biodiversity uh, on land depends on, um, and drives a policy which encourages farmers to practice really unsustainable practices, um, overstocking of livestock, um, a really in unsustainable level of importing um, GM grain from places like South America. And then we have an overproduction of dairy and we're constantly trying to create new markets for this dairy. So we do things like use mass amounts of energy to dry this milk into milk powder. We export terrible Western habits to um, other parts of the world that disincentivize breastfeeding. Um, and you know we really just need to start accepting the realities of of where we are in relation to climate change, our role that we need to play in it. And really and truly we need policy that actually reflects that, that's ambitious. And the only way that we can get this policy to work and for people to believe in it and want to do it is if the policy making starts with the people who will be practicing it. And um, so I'd really echo Sean's sentiments in relation to that. And I look forward to taking any questions. I'll hand over to the next speaker here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Holly. That's really nice that you talk about the reality check in particular and looking especially, you know, for this reality check that we need in policy, but also in legal frameworks as well. Um, so that's very nice. And of course, as you say, the, the agricultural section in Ireland is so important in whatever happens in terms of climate action. So um, this is a really important part of the debate. Um, thank you very much. And so now I'm going to pass the floor to Montserrat who's joining us uh, from the trade unions. And Montserrat, um, if you could give us, uh, tell us about you know, where Europe is in terms of advancing the just transition and what do you expect, what do you hope to see um, in the upcoming climate pact, let's say. And also, I think you're going to give us some, some good examples um, of where just transition has been successful. Please. You're muted, Montserrat. now. Uh, so thank you uh, to the organizers. Thank you, Charlotte, because I think that put the 
people at the center uh, is uh, sounds familiar to us as a trade unions and of course we share uh, the majority of the principles of this study because the 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 green deal is not only about the reduction of emissions that it is we have committed as a trade unions uh, last year to reduce the emissions our position was a common position to reduce emissions on the 55 percent uh, at 2030 and zero net emissions in 2050 means we have quite advanced and i want and i want also to remark that why do we need the just transition because have an impact on people because that uh, that uh, transformation have an impact on people and i want to say that the the recession that we are now uh, beginning to leave due to the COVID crisis uh, makes more, uh, uh, has become even greater the, to put the focus on the new Green Deal because the really aspires to ensure a just transition by protecting the health, the economic well being of citizens and jobs also, and to protect the environment. Um, this is uh, also uh, important to remark that uh, climate impact on workers and communities. Communities. And uh, I must to say that at global level, 1.2 billion jobs or 40% of the total world employment depend directly on the ecosystem services. Jobs everywhere are dependent on a stable environment. Every year, on average, natural disasters cause it an or exacerbated by humanity result in the loss of 23 million working life years or the equivalent of the 0.8% of years work. And even in a scenario of effective climate change mitigation, temperature increase resulting from climate change will lead to the loss of the equivalent of 72 million full-time jobs by 2030 due to the heat stress. Developing countries also and the most vulnerable population groups are most exposed to those impacts. I think it's important to remark this global level because we cannot work only at the European level on questions that have a global impact and it's important to say. I want to remark also one important thing that each year the International Trade Union Confederation uh, organizes a global poll and this year uh, the lemma was on a fragile ground, working people living on the edge. More than two-thirds of people were worried about climate change, rising inequality, the misuse of their personal skills, and the fear to lose their jobs. I think it's relevant to know that this is a very recent, uh, uh, recent result of the annual poll. And uh, of course, the sectorial impacts, uh, Pedro uh, have remarked, and also Holly uh, focus on the agriculture, but uh, we will see see that due to the uh, just transition uh, uh, transformation that we will need, of course, there will be jobs that will be transformed. Agriculture is one of them, one of the emitters, important uh, emitters on CO2. And we will have the opportunity, we have seen during this crisis, how important is the agriculture. But also we have other sectors that also are big polluters that they will suffer a big transformation and they will have the possibility to create jobs. For example, on construction, on agriculture, on renewable energy sector, there is a potential creation of jobs. That means that when we are living the phase out call in several communities and regions in, in Europe, we must also provide a certain um, good news that if all those changes are done with social dialogue, with community participation, there is a positive uh, job creation uh, possibility. Of course, the mining and extraction and pol uh, oil and, and, and other polluter uh, energy resources that continue being relevant in Europe will suffer uh, a decrease of jobs. And we need also to see other sectors that are not always on the focus, but like tourism that have a dependency on the transport also. And uh, we, we will need to, to, to transform uh, and we will need to be there to negotiate a good jobs in 
the process of this transformation, which transition we want and why for trade unions and workers is important because we are actors of the fight on climate change and because countries with higher levels of unionization have lower per capita carbon footprints because from long time ago, trade unions are uh, important players and they have strong concerns on how important is this transformation and to play a key role. I want to say also that we work on five pillars on just transition, skills, reskilling, strategic planning and investment, social security systems, that means social protection, that is an important, an important element of this transformation. Just transition without social protection is difficult and human and workers' rights. I was very happy to listen, uh, Marin, because the, the word solidarity and rights are not always key elements when we talk about just transition and when we talk about uh, climate change transformation. And I think that we must take into account this. We work also with ILO because we think that the key principles on just transition were the first step that we, we use it to explain to our members in what consists the just transition uh, when we talk about jobs, for example. And uh, if you remember, the Solidarity and Just Transition Silesia Declaration was uh, uh, an important, uh, an important uh, agreement that was done in Katowice because it was the first time that uh, we put at the center the impact on jobs in communities and also and how important it was to have this inclusive process Process because the presentation that you have done at the beginning is clear that what John says is that without this inclusive process, with all the relevant uh, uh, parts of the transformation are invited to be at the table, if they are not invited, will be impossible. And I must say that we have good examples, for example, because uh, in Europe, uh, we have this, uh, this transformation that is the, the, the change of of several regions that they have a strong dependency on coal. And uh, I must say that trade unions, they have played a relevant role working uh, uh, close with the communities, because when we talk about the coal, the coal regions, we are not talking only about the miners. We are talking about all the environment, the economic and social environment that have a strong dependency. You cannot transform and close the mine and say bye bye because you are creating a demographic problem. What jobs you need to provide to that people? That is what was the result of the phase out call agreement in Spain. And I want to present as a good example because after many years of a certain cowardice from governments that they don't want to confront the, the close of the mines that they were not any more efficient, arrives uh, the possibility with uh, serious governments, serious, serious employers and trade unions that they have decided to sit and to find an agreement. And this agreement now is pending to the decision of the budget, final decision that, that will provide the necessary investment to the regions to create these new alternative jobs and to create this new alternative for the citizens. We have the Plan del Carbon, for example, was uh, early retirement schemes. Uh, it was uh, the job creation was the agreement to create the same number of jobs that will be destroyed with the with the, the phase out call and the close of the mines and the environment restoration. That is on another op opportunity to create good jobs in the region. The lessons from the Spain's experience uh, is the agreement with three mining and energy unions, the first plan of just transition, the proposal from the trade union side to create a just transition institute to develop the projects, to monitor if the, the investments are really covering the needs of the population. And of course, the just transition contracts helping the regions to consolidate the employment of the, of the future. I want, if I have time to present another good example, that is the German agreement. Uh, uh, Germany, as you know, uh, have decided also 
the phase out call and they have put on the table a huge number a uh, huge number of investments uh, i think is one of the big in, uh, amount of investments in europe 40 billions in infrastructure research and new sectors and trade unions and communities they they were part of this commission the commission on growth structural change and employment i think is very important to remark and because we are also uh, we are also in uh, talking about uh, Ireland, I must say that in 2016, the Republic of Ireland had the third highest level of greenhouse emissions. And after this, this uh, that we can constate, it was a, a call for a just transition forum that integrates the unions and the, the, the communities. And they propose a, a number of transformations and investments in the regions. The lessons that we learned from the Irish experience was uh, that they were participation, they were uh, key players, uh, and they managed the transition. I want also to say that there are uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, experiences in cities and in small villages that we as the trade unions we begin to be involved because regions and cities uh, from all uh, dimensions they, they are playing also a key role in the transition process first because in cities we have a high number of pollution and is where the the jobs needs to be transformed and for that reason there is the c40 the organization that deals with uh, major cities and we are working with them on the establishment of just transition plans in europe the first and pilot uh, has been the oslo just transition plan where the trade unions they have played a key role in the um, uh, implementation of the uh, quality job creation because it's not the question of create jobs we want to use the possibility to uh, use the transformation the just transition to create good jobs and i don't want to forget to mention the question of gender because just transition means gender equality for trade unions and for communities and we need to use this opportunity sometimes crises have a faster effect and the transformations are going very fast that we suppose at the beginning of the process to uh, avoid to replicate the mistakes of the past. We need to uh, introduce the question of gender equality in all our, our actions because that will have an impact on the future generations. Just transition is about workers, just transition is about communities and we expect to continue uh, working with you and uh, to, to, to play a key role in this transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montserrat. That's uh, really good and very helpful that you bring in um, the examples of what's actually happening already in terms of, um, of just transition in some places. And also you underline the importance of democratic processes um, and inclusive processes, more important. And, and social dialogue. And I, I, I put I, the center on social dialogue as key element. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you very much for that, Montserrat. I see... Um, we are getting pressed for time, but we will um, now give the floor to uh, the Minister O'Brien. And I see also some of the questions are actually being answered as we go along. So uh, this is already really great, but we will, uh, I will refer to some of them um, shortly. But please, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Joe O'Brien. I understand you're going to say a few words um, about what's already been said and also community-led uh, development for climate action, please. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'll be as <clears throat> excuse me. I'll, I'll I'll be as brief as I can. I know the time time is tight, um, but I suppose like when I first heard about this project and and read about the report, um, the word that comes to mind, and it was one of the last words that Mary Robinson used in her speech, was was frankly excitement. And on a couple of levels, uh, personally for me, I've worked in the community voluntary sector um, for. 20 years up until a year ago when I got elected as TD for the first time, working on various social justice issues. And then my other great passion is climate action as well. So I've never seen a document where the two merge in such a productive way and in such a way that flags, for me, opportunity. Uh, and, and this was mentioned earlier as well. There is very much positive opportunity when we bring uh, these two areas together. And I suppose I'm particularly conscious of it in my position now, 
where I'm junior minister in the Department of Rural and Community Development, and I have specific responsibility over community development. And uh, I'm conscious to flag some of the levers that are actually available to us where we can um, activate a lot of the things that are that are being mentioned uh, in the task FEPS, FEPS report. Um, and I'm probably going to forget some of them, but I, I think it's important to throw a few of them out. Um, firstly, is simply this department, Department of Rural and Community Development. We have extraordinary links with community organizations all around the country um, in, in a variety of different ways. And we support them in different ways as well. And, and, and I think it's important to mention a couple of them. The local development companies, I think, will be key. Um, we have a huge asset in Ireland in terms of our public participation networks. So these are networks in every local authority area in the country of community bodies uh, that meet and network and feed into policy development. We have 15,000 of these organizations across the country. So the raw material and, and a lot of the um, network is there to sort of animate the proposals that are being put forward in, in the task report. Um, Another important point to make, and, and, and it's a, a program that we oversee here in Ireland, it's called SICAP, it's the Social Inclusion and Community Activation Program, and it's actually part funded by the ESF. Uh, it runs in kind of four year tranches. In about eight, nine months time, we'll be looking at how to cast the next SICAP program, which will be for four or five years. And I think it has to be heavily informed by um, community-led development for climate justice and social justice as well. Um, and it's a huge opportunity to, I suppose, embed the approach that's uh, described in the report into some of the formal systems in government as well, while also, I suppose, supporting community action on the ground as well. Um, I should say a little bit about my remit as well. I, I also have some remit in the Department of Social Protection uh, and I, I oversee a roadmap on social inclusion as well. And so I'm particularly conscious of, of issues around food poverty, for example, and that. Um, I think it is worth saying as well, um, in the re recent budget here in Ireland, all our revenues from the carbon tax, and I know there's debate on carbon tax, went towards uh, cl climate action or climate justice areas. So for example, uh, one third of the revenues from carbon tax went to social welfare payments to those who needed them most. And the ASRI uh, described the budget reallocations as progressive. Um, so there is possibilities here already that have, that have started to move in, in, in the right direction. Um, what else do I need to say? I, I, I mean, I had a quick glance at the report and just some initial reactions and uh, Deputy Kern's input um, was quite relevant as well. My old childhood, I grew up on a 20 cow uh, dairy farm. I, I know Deputy Kearns grew up in a 16 cow dairy farm, um, but it became uh, economically unviable for a variety of, of, of reasons. So I kind of, I was very interested in the rural chapter in the document as well. And I now find myself in a community that's heavily dependent on horticulture, um, a market gardening area in North County, Dublin. And the growers are now clearly identifying with a number of years now that their season is becoming more unpredictable. They don't really know what's going to happen in the growing season. Uh, and so it's difficult for them to plan and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, also looking at the report, um, I, I was struck by the public transport um, uh, descriptions in that and the distance in Ireland in particular between the local public transport uh, modes uh, and people living in rural Ireland. Important to say, I think, in the programme for government, and it's something that's being missed a little bit, is that we are committing to trebling what we call local link bus service journeys uh, over the course of this government as well. So, so there is levers that we can, that, that we can use to, to improve the situation. And funnily enough, before I came to this meeting this morning, I was in a, a parliamentary committee meeting being questioned on various aspects of my remit. And I was being asked about remote working and what we're doing as a department um, to promote work, remote working. It turns out we're leading in the promotion of remote working. And it's, it's, it's a real possibility, I think, in this as well, in terms of the big challenge that we have in, term of, in, times, in, in terms of climate action that, that COVID has brought to the fore. And it's something that we as a department are, are leading on and pushing on. There's huge opportunities, I think, in terms of 
climate action, but also climate justice in that regard um, as well. Um, I don't want to, I won't talk too much more. I, I would like to say that um, we have been looking at uh, the task proposal for a community engagement model. And uh, just to say that you, you have an ad advocate for the, for the approach, you have a champion for the approach. We very much like the approach in the department and we, we would like to work with you to see how we can support you in, in, in rolling that out and in piling it as, it, piling it as well. Um, the revised climate action plan um, will have as one of its three key pillars, local engagement and activation. And I think um, my department and its connections with the community and voluntary sector, um, and I think with task and the model that you've shown, um, that there is, there is a clear place for this approach. And I suppose the message that I want people to go away with is that you, you have a champion for this approach that you've laid out in the report. Uh, we like it, we like it a lot and we'd like to support you in, in realizing it. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. Um, your words are very, very important to us. Um, it's great that you said that and also for Sean in particular. Um, so thank you so much um, for coming on today, for joining us and staying with us for the debate. Um, and indeed, it's really nice um, to hear that you feel that that is, uh, it definitely has, you know, that this work that we've done has, has the merits uh, that we want, you know, that we really want to see it put into practice. So this is really fantastic. Um, I realise that we are just going over time, so as moderator this is where my job becomes slightly difficult. Um, I also see that people have been really active in the reactions and the questions and answers. Um, if I just read a couple out, but then we're going to go back to uh, the speakers just to give a final uh, remarks from each of you, please. Um, so I'll just, you know, just, just to go through a few of them, there was, you know, talking a lot about how to empower uh, particip participatory democracy processes um, and also uh, more widely how to kind of counter consumer society, talking about aviation emissions. Um, and also I see a question also from Agnes Huba MEP uh, about what, uh, what about a European Social Innovation Institute to gather all the community-led social innovations re researched in Horizon before and provide uh, knowledge and financial support to communities. So I think that this is a very good idea coming from, from her side. And also um, somebody mentioned that as public participation is resource intensive, what uh, support does the EU and Irish government need to provide uh, for this people's transition? Um, so, I, you know, <laughs> that's just a few of them, but um, if I could just give the floor um, briefly then, um, firstly to Sean, because uh, I'm sure that you want to react to this, and um, then to each of the speakers, um, if you could give, you know, just some final remarks and, and final messages, please. Thank you. Sean, please. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I, I'm kind of just blown away by the participation today. It's been really uh, brilliant to have so many uh, perspectives brought to bear. Um, I think we all talk about participation coming from uh, different angles, but we're all trying to make sure that that participation and, as Montserrat said, the social dialogue component uh, is central to this. Obviously, it's it's a real, really exciting to hear Minister O'Brien um, uh, supporting the the, the um, model so so wholeheartedly and. Uh, Oh, it's 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 um, just to say thank you to Pedro and Holly and Montserrat and Mr. O'Brien and yourself, Charlotte, for a, a brilliant panel and and, and thanks for um, uh, supporting the work. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. And then over to um, in our order of speakers. So Pedro first, please. Yes, just to thank everybody for the uh, incredible participation. A lot of questions and answers. I myself tried to answer one of them directly at the at the at the question question answers uh, window. But um, just just to just to tell you that in the end, I think that the, the, if there is some kind of conclusion from what everybody has said here is is that community uh, uh, led transformation, community led transition is the only one that will work. 
And I fully concur with that. I have been as myself a city councillor 15 years ago, something like that. I, I was responsible for social policy by then, and I, I'm completely concur that it will be through the communities that will manage the transition. It won't be something from top for, to the bottom, that's for sure. So the resources, somebody was working, was asking for the resources. If the, the, the proposals we have put forward on the Just Transition Fund uh, come to the end to to, to to be part of the regulation as we expect there will be money available at the regional transition plans to develop communitary services and we think and i believe not just in social services to the communities but in communitary services in general and the participation of the communities of the trade unions of the local stakeholders in building in 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 in, in, in developing the transitional plans that will be critical because it's at the beginning of this uh, number of years of the to, to implement the plans that will have to define how these communities who can 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 actually transition from this heavily coal uh, production uh, energy production or or whatever to a, a greener uh, situation and that's something that will be built from the beginning involving them from the beginning but the resources have to go to these communities concrete resources to concrete projects or smes uh, for instance employments so that we can manage the transition it has to come from the works to the concrete results on people's lives otherwise it will be very difficult to get them involved in the in the green transition that's my experience at least thank you Great, thank you very much, um, Pedro. And then Holly, please. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, I suppose just um, overall point is that we know transition is absolutely essential. And um, we know that there's only one way to do it, working with communities, not making decisions for them without consulting them. Um, and we know that all stakeholders involved in the transition have to feel like it will benefit them and their communities for it to actually work effectively. Um, I think we know that we need more ambitious targets and certainly in, in an Irish context and um, I'd be excited to, to work with Minister O'Brien in an Irish context on that. Thank you. This is great. Uh, I love it how this is already being developed and taken forward already. Um, so um, Montserrat, please, um, if you want to say a few final words. As I think that uh, I, I agree with several of the speakers and I want to say that, that we need to provide hope uh, and we need to provide trust in the future, I think is relevant because we are living in, dif in difficult moments and we can be inspired by the proposals from communities, from trade unions in these processes that we need to encourage because uh, social innovation, someone uh, in, the, in the chat says, what about uh, innovation? Social innovation is also important and sometimes the best ideas come from the people that are on the ground, they are working, they are living the daily problems and they are not only technological it means that social innovation is really important and is essential also as always the financial tools to finance the projects that they come from these uh, these communities because if we don't have the necessary financial tools that we will have for sure it's impossible to implement and to have uh, good uh, results for all thank you Okay, great. Um, so I don't know, Minister O'Brien, if you want to say a couple more words or... Um, yeah. very, very, very briefly, um, just on this European social innovation idea, as far as I know, there is actually um, movement on that in terms of a yeah. centre for social innovation. And I know there's been a couple of Irish organisations that we support um, are, are pitching for that as well. Um, and, and maybe just as a final point, um, just to say that, that that I will certainly support this approach. I have little to compare it to. I've, I've never been a minister before. I haven't been in, in any other department. <laughs> but my experience of this department is, is that it does take its lead from organizations on the ground, probably to a, a greater extent than any other department I expect. It's the nature of, of our remit, I think, that we need to be and have to be connected with organizations on the ground. And so we're in a very good position, I think, um, to bring forward uh, and to progress um, uh, community-led development, I think, for, for climate justice. And, and I'm certainly going to do, do all I can to forward that. And, th and thank you very much today as well for, for accommodating me and, and letting me say a few words. Appreciate it. It's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, ours is really the pleasure. Um, thank you so much. I think we're going to round off there. So I hope some of the questions have been answered at least. Um, if not, you know, we are here. If you do have any 
specific questions. I saw there were some actually quite specific questions in the chat. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you can find the publication online uh, on FEP's website and on TASC website. And also, um, you know, you can find the recording of this uh, on FEP's YouTube channel. Um, I just also want to thank everyone, basically. So thank you to all the speakers. Um, thank you, especially to Sean, of course, for all the work you've done um, towards this report. And also thank you very much to the FEPS colleagues and TASC colleagues who are behind the scenes helping uh, put all this together. Um, you know who you are. Um, so thank you uh, once again. Thank you, everybody, also to participating. I can't forget you. And um, we really hope to, to continue this discussion uh, very soon. Um, OK, have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank bye, -bye. You.